。哦，反面。呃、uh, ，Well, some of the folks will continue to log in.、Um, as some of the people may be moving from another meeting over here.、Uh, well, welcome everyone.、Uh, this is the transformative vertical flight working group. Uh, public safety、uh, meeting number eighty-two. Today is Thursday, January twenty-fifth, twenty twenty-four. Very glad to introduce two outstanding speakers we have today.、Uh, first one is、uh, Bruce Cogan.、Uh, he's with NASA.、Um, he is the SBR、uh, ARMD, the Aeronautical Research Mission Director. Uh, liaison at the NASA headquarters, and he is responsible for col、uh, collaborating with NASA ARMD projects to develop yearly solicitations and to represent NASA ARMD's interest in the proposal review, ranking, and selections, and so on. Uh, uh, Bruce has、uh, showed us a overview summary of the latest. NASA SBIR、uh, solicitation, and today it's going to bring us、um, a little bit more detail and in insight、uh, how he look at the、uh, the promising and some example of successful projects before. The and the second speaker is uh, uh, Dr. Iman Chakra Borty.、Uh, he's an、uh, assist assistant professor in the Department of Aerospace Engineering at Auburn University.、Uh, for folks、uh, in our region,、um, Auburn is the the university、uh, with excellent aeronautical、uh, program, and we have a lot of respect for. And just as important, has a good football team. So when you're not doing the, the testing, you can probably go watch a,、uh, the team win a few a、uh, few games.、Uh, that was encouraging. Uh, but he's also the director of the Vehicle Systems Dynamics and Design Laboratory.、Uh, I'll let uh, uh, Iman explain all the details. But today he's going to talk to us about a very interesting、uh, methodology and capability of、uh, embed a much more realistic, real-world、uh, battery capability functioning iteration. Into the multi-function, innovative uh, uh, aerial vehicle design optimization program.、Um, I listened to his presentation at、uh, the Aerotech conference. I said, "Well, we gotta、uh, bring this to our members. <laughs> this is such an interesting topic." So, without further ado,、uh, let me.、Uh, oh, I'm sorry.、A、couple important、uh, housekeeping、uh, topic. One is there are several conferences coming,、uh, including the the one、uh, in ten days in Santa Clara, Santa Clara uh, uh, Transformative Vertical Flight twenty twenty four. Important thing is we will have a roundtable for our working group members, and the one that、uh, you think you might be interested, please invite them. And of course, there is a、uh, technical meeting on development, affordability, and qualification of complex systems in Huntsville. In February, and of course uh, the uh, HAI Heli Expo is also、uh, in February, late February, and NASA also have an Imagine Aviation、uh, scheduled for February twenty seven, twenty nine, which is a、uh, online program.、Uh, everybody can register and log in, and follow that as a Aerotech in March.、Uh, that uh, has a co、um, session about the. H two arrow segment. So all those are very interesting uh, topics. Uh, I'd like to、uh, spend one minute to talk about this roundtable.、Uh, we have、uh, able to manage a、uh, on the Wednesday、uh, at the Santa Clara conference、uh, on Wednesday afternoon, five thirty to seven thirty p.m. At room two hundred one, I strongly invite, in, encourage, and invite everyone,、uh, our members, to attend.、Uh, join us at the roundtable session. 
and we'll get to know each other a little more and we can brainstorm, we can talk about, about the future directions and the efforts and challenges, opportunities. Um, if you were able to come or know somebody who is interested in coming, please uh, send me an email. Uh, that's the, my email address at the uh, for the working group uh, or text me so that we can uh, properly assess how many people may be attending. Uh, we don't have a true round table, but we have a U-shaped arrangement. I think it would be a very good setup. So I uh, strongly encourage anyone who is going to be there, please join us at the conference. Now, with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and uh, I'll let Bruce take over. Bruce, the floor is yours. All right. Thanks, Johnny. Let me um, make sure I get all this out here. All right. Uh, how are we looking? Looks good? Looks good. All right. Thanks. Well, thanks, Johnny, um, for the invite. Um, thanks to all the attendees and such. Um, excited to talk a little bit more about NASA SBR, STTR. I did present as the other working group just before our solicitation went live. Um, so now it's open. I can share a little bit more. Um, still not too much. We do have a blackout, so I um, can't give specifics, but certainly can tell you a little bit about the program. Um, I'll, I'd like to promote um, Imagine Aviation, which is, Johnny brought up as a future event. Um, very good thing to find out kind of NASA's current, more importantly, future interest, which we um, definitely support in SBIR. So give you a lot of insight on what NASA is working on. Um, I won't be able to attend, but we are trying to get somebody to represent SBIR. So they can certainly give you a little bit more information. Um, they have the presentations and I believe we did a poster last year and we'll have that as well as somebody to talk to. So um, anyway, encourage you to attend that if you get the chance. And let's see. Great. So again, I'm Bruce Kogan. Um, I'm the AMD liaison for the SBR program. So what that means is we help our AMD projects to develop our yearly solicitations and um, also work in the review process um, and selection to present the best um, proposals from small businesses, you know, to meet our technology needs as well as future good potential for commercialization of um, the technology developing by small business. Um, I highlight we provide as we look at it, early stage funding for R&D. We are probably a little more innovation oriented than um, folks I work with um, on DOD. Um, not necessarily a product, uh, certainly that's what we look at, but really what are your ideas and how can we help you develop those um, both to commercialize and potentially to meet some um, you know, NASA technologies means. Um, we're about 1 million over the first three years um, for both the um, phase one, phase two uh, awards, and then lots of post phase two opportunities, um, you know, for if you for matching funding from either NASA or non NASA investors. We don't um, take your equity, you keep your IP, um, the opportunity to work with some NASA experts on your technology, uh, possibly fly on future missions, be it um, space related or, of course, our area, air and air and D. Um, again, um, we also, some stuff we'll talk about is ways, some initiatives we have to hone your business skills. You know, a lot of times, smaller businesses and some good technical, technical geeks, as I say, engineers, I'm one, so um, we're recovering one. But, you know, how do you develop those business skills? Um, some really good programs that we provide. And of course, you know, I think one of the highlights, you know, working with NASA always looks good, you know, for moving your things forward. Um, so two basic, we have two basic solicitations. They both opened um, January 9th. Um, proposals were due in early March, um, both SBR and STTR. Um, very similar, there's different subtopics. Um, uh, SBR essentially doesn't require an academic partner, but it's very encouraged to do. We um, always see good collaborations between small businesses and research institutes. Um, 
I'll, I'll refer to our doctor, uh, certainly encourage who's speaking next, uh, definitely um, look at the program. SCTR does require um, a, a research institute to be part of the uh, program. Um, funding levels are the same. It's different technologies. We have one ARMD related one, which I'm really excited about. And we'll talk about that a little bit more, um, but there's others as well. So um, definitely look at both of those programs. And again, solicitation is out. Um, we are looking at R&D, more um, funding ideas that will solve some of our challenges. You know, we, we have a lot of things we need to do. We can't do it all. So we looked at small businesses to help us in their mission. Um, kind of requirements, small business, 500 employees or less. Um, we do get questions about foreign participation, um, both for research institutes and small businesses. Um, and generally we are focused on United States small businesses, but there are opportunities to be a subcontractor to the prime and also um, potentially an additional research institution. So um, primarily we need both a US company and a research institute from the United States, but there are possibilities. Um, if you're a foreign company that do have subsidy, uh, US subsidy or their own business, they're certainly allowed to um, allowed to uh, apply. Of course, we're not, um, other government agencies definitely have um, programs as well. I'll, I'll throw out to AFWorks and DOD, they're definitely um, investing a lot of this EV toll and other technologies. So definitely look at their solicitations. Um, it's kind of our 2023, um, these are our phase one awards. We just kicked off the reviews for the phase twos. Most of these have been completed. Um, 249 small businesses, 39 research institutes. Um, this is throughout the program, not just AMD. We um, work with um, the other mission directorates, science, human explorations, um, space technology, space technology development, and STTR. So um, this is over the overall program. So a little bit smaller than DOD, but certainly um, lots more research innovation focused, I would say. Um, kind of our process, so the um, phase ones is the initial, again, that solicitation is now open. Um, basically 150K, a six month contract um, for SBIRs and 13 months for um, the STTRs, um, giving you a little more time to learn how research institutes and small businesses can work together. Um, again, we look at these more feasibility, idea generation and such, and from that, we go to phase twos, um, which will be around this time next year. Um, we, we do those solicitations kind of end of the year, early early year. Um, those are all from a phase one. We don't do anything direct phase two, but here you're really developing that technology, potentially prototype development and such um, to, to your contract and stuff to really develop the technology. Phase three beyond that is then with outside investment um, Either, either NASA is funding that, not NASA SBR, but um, NASA projects, as well as you know outside investors, be it DOD, um, Boeing, Boeing's, um, others, and such, um, to really you know kind of move that forward. Um, down below, if you look at the box at the bottom, we have several um, really good opportunities. So that we provide matching funds for um, things that will help commercialization of the technology. Um, also, you know, two orange boxes, i and TABA, as I mentioned, those are programs that you can sign up for um, when you do your proposals to provide outside, um, you know, business, you know, more of a business, help you develop a business and such. Those are um, additional funding beyond that, that available. And we, again, we encourage that um, signing up for that is definitely does not seen as a negative. So um, encourage anybody is doing a proposal to, to explore those options. Kind of our process is a little bit, um, this is a little bit dated um, from last year, but um, as we are right now, the solicitation release went out early January, proposals are due in March. Then we go through various selections, um, which I'll try a little bit of insight, not too much. Um, you know, select the best of NASA interests and such, as well as commercialization potential. Um, we do awards and then um, 
basically in August, then we will announce the um, phase one awards. And then you're given for an SBR, you have about six months to do that. And then off to the phase two proposal submission. So get a little more detail. Um, SBR.NAS uh, in the slides and durable from John, you can send it to anybody it's wants. Um, write down sbir.nasa.gov. That's kind of our overall site. So information on the program, what we're looking for reviews, um, the solicitation itself, um, all kinds of great information as well. And probably, probably the most important is we do provide uh, POCs at the centers, um, you know, who can help you with the process um, in moving forward. Um, a few highlights, you know, kind of looking at, um, you know, this group, um, some things to look at. I encourage you to look at others, both inside of um, aeronautics. They're the ones starting with A, um, as well as the other mission directorates and, of course, the um, SGTR. Um, We'll, I'll get in a little bit kind of what we're looking at, but these are some that are relevant and certainly I would, you know, is a good start. You know, um, I never know who, what companies we have here, but these are certainly ones where we've seen, you know, some good things from um, small business in the area and even some, um, some of the EV tall manufacturers. Um, if I look at A302, which is about the middle here, um, particularly, um, we're looking, this is, we look at vehicle technologies, but also things to help airspace. And um, probably public service, a big priority area um, is wildfire, aerial wildfire response. And we're also looking at emergency response. Um, these are, this is the CERO project and NASA is relatively new. And we've been working with them, you know, to identify their technology needs. Um, so it's definitely one of interest um, you should look at. Um, I'll, I'll say above that A202 and it look at, again, look at the solicitation. Um, A302 is kind of focused on airspace. Um, we worked in more vehicle. We worked to put in some content related to wildfire response and that and autonomy aspect. So um, still some basic autonomy but we've had some specific things to a CERO. So um, definitely look at that, you know, for the, you know, the public service and kind of the focus of this group. Um, at the bottom, um, again, somewhat relevant, you know, if we do have some eVTOL or uh, other manufacturers and such, um, we've done some partnerships um, with this um, Alkali, who's doing um, an interesting concept. Um, Cub Crafters and Electra Aero have participated in this um, with us either as a primary PI or as a um, as a um, subcontractor. So we're actually looking at some tools for um, using this and validating them on um, actual air, EV toll aircraft. So it's a pretty exciting one. Um, finally, um, S1604, second from the bottom, um, this is actually under our science mission directorate. Um, and generally, we don't develop vehicles at NASA. We don't really want UAVs as deliverables and stuff or um, UAM vehicles. We're not that we're funding. But this one, we're actually looking at that, you know, some platforms, um, UAV platforms, um, you know, for um, earth science and such, you know, future um, HAPS, high, high altitude um, science missions. So definitely something to look at as well um, of interest. Uh, so kind of my general, you know, if you're doing this, um, I can't get specifics. Um, I'll say we, we do have, a, once we're out of blackout, um, if you haven't applied, if you have applied, um, you know, get with some of the contacts. We do offer access to subject matter experts to better understand um, NASA research needs and such. Not at this point, because we are blackout, but certainly going forward. But some general things, um, read the solicitation, the submittal instructions thoroughly. Um, we provide pointers of subtopics that may be um, relevant. So certainly explore those um, and look at the exclusions. Um, my biggest thing is we don't, other than the one subtopic, we, we don't want vehicles um, unless you can somewhat time the technology. Um, 
we look more, we look highly at innovation. We're not really looking at evolution of existing products, improving them, um, except in the case of potential innovative repurposing. So using something for something, you know, something AMD related for something that may not have been in the first place. Um, always address state of the art. And basically say, why is your proposal technology innovative? You know, why is this, why should we fund this? Why is it innovative? Um, that said, we also do look at feasibility. Um, is this a feasible um, technology? Um, sometimes, and, and part of that is part of the phase one award is proving that. And sometimes we find it isn't feasible and we also encourage focus, you know, companies to say pivot and go to some other method as well. Uh, if something didn't work. Um, we look at and we do look at qualifications, experience and design team, um, previous awards and, and facilities. So those are important as well. So um, if you've got this, you know, can you you propose this technology? Can you actually do it? Um, always good to discuss NASA infusion as well as commercialization paths. I'd say it's a little bit more of the phase two, but um, this certainly helps in a phase one. Um, so we, again, we focus on technologies. So these are technologies that are useful for anybody, say, developing an EV tall vehicle, not just, you know, specific things. We, we'd love to help you develop your new EV tall vehicle, but with all the folks putting things on market, we, we can't fund them all. So we try to do things that are, um, you know, relevant, useful for all folks in the industry. I'll get a little bit, um, a couple of previous awards. Um, that we've done, you know, under these subtopics, um, both ARMD as well as um, SBIR, um, kind of the ones I'm interested in, you know, Cup Crafters uh, is developing this um, high lift, electric high lift augmenting slats. And we did this as an SCTR award. It's kind of ex exciting. Um, it's probably more commercialization focused. The company is hoping to sell these um, to improve, um, you know, short lift, um, capabilities of their their vehicles, which are, you know, paper, paper cub based. So kind of neat how we're using, you know, future technology on, you know, aircraft from the 1930s. Um, mentioned participation by some of the big companies, um, Electra Aero here um, under that SMD, they have a phase two, so they're developing um, potential hail platform for Earth science missions. I'm really excited about that. So that is one area we are actually looking at vehicles and such. Um, up in the upper right, improving aviation. Um, this again, a phase two award. Um, we're looking at, you know, portable air traffic system for wildfire operations. So again, something um, more airspace focused, you know, but will help those future um, missions, you know, for help, help the firefighters um, fight. Um, fires, as well as, you know, we're also getting emergency response. So helping folks in disasters, be it hurricanes, tornadoes, earthquakes. And finally on this, um, innovative dynamics, um, again, a little more vehicle focused, again, um, anti-IC system that they're developing for urban air mobility vehicles. So again, something that would be useful to anybody developing EV tall vehicles. Couple success stories. Um, that we had recently, these are going beyond the phase two where we've, um, you know, invested more. Hey, Johnny, how am I doing for time? I don't want to take too much from the other speaker. Oh, um, uh, you're doing fine. Uh, okay. We may have to cut a little short on the Q&A part. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll, I won't do the time, so I'll, I'll put these out. These are some stuff that's gone beyond. Um, we fund either, um, you know, once you go fast, phase two, of course, um, you know, it's trying to come a lot of success from NASA projects. We do have some, but very good and outside um, investors. Um, these are some CCRPP awards. This is kind of our highest award. So um, requires a minimum of, of half a million dollars of outside funding, um, but then we will match that in the program up to two and a half million. So, um, some stuff we've been having more and more successes on these awards but we also have lower level ones as well um where we'll do matching um from 35k on up um a couple of dead interesting um 
near Earth autonomy. This one's just wrapping up. We're using drones for aircraft inspection. Resilient um, up in the upper right. Uh, it's basically some data, data, weather data, sensor monitoring um, system. They're actually developing a test range with AFWorks um, funding uh, up in the Syracuse area. And uh, electric power systems and Boeing stuff for battery modeling and management, um, again, might be relevant to a other speaker. So um, definitely some interesting work. And again, uh, one of the things we've been doing on the earth science is um, you know, developing UAV platforms, Black Swift kind of um, very innovative company, um, both developing vehicles, developing um, say autopilots and avionics. And actually they fly earth science missions under contract to NASA, NOAA and others. So as I said, sbr.nasa.gov is your Best stop, the, under there, you can again provide information on the program, all the requirements, um, rules, how do you submit proposal on the solicitations themselves. Um, so definitely look at that, um, you know, figure out which ones you're interested in. Um, if FSTR, you know, always find a good research institute partner. Um, we have emails to provide information and such. Um, <laughs> Center, each center, each of the NASA centers, and we have four ARMD centers, Armstrong, Ames, Glenn, and Langley. They all reps who can talk to you at least on the process and such, provide information um, a little bit, again, high level and stuff. But um, and also can you, um, you know, eventually set you up with sub, 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 you know, subject matter experts as well, so you can talk to you directly. Um, we have some YouTubes and stuff that actually will help you prep. I don't think they're doing a seminar, but they do have recordings from previous ones. Um, again, more resources there that you can find, um, blogs, mentors, success stories, and things like that. So definitely go there initially. So we are open as of January 9th. We did open our 2024 solicitation. We do one once a year. Um, proposals are due March 11th, 2024, and announcements we made in June. Um, we are developing a new system. So if you have participated before starting on phase one, we have a new system. Uh, I've seen it. It looks pretty straightforward. Encouraging folks, you sign up for this. You know, under the solicitation, they will they show you the instructions to sign up for that. So definitely do that. Um, understand that and submit things early. Um, we do have a deadline, but we've had proposals, companies had issues um, submitting. And if we don't, if you don't meet the deadline, generally we don't give you, um, we're pretty hard on that. So, you know, you spend time working the proposal. So get it in early as possible. And again, I encourage you to look at that system. Um, and again, kind of short term saying the same thing. Um, you can sign up for the ProSAMs again, and it's definitely good to look at that. I think we will mm -hmm. be providing, you know, information and such. Um, sign up for the email and we'll provide information on any training that we have on that system. And that's it. All right, thank you very much, Bruce. Um, uh, I guess uh, I understand, Bruce, you have another engagement you have to run. Um, uh Actually, I don't. So I can actually I can stay on if we want to do the next presentation. I I, I will stick around and okay. If you can questions. stay, that would be great because uh, maybe at the end, if folks want to stay a little later, we can uh, have a few Q and A. Uh, to for consideration of time, uh, I'd like to now switch topic. Uh, by the way, uh, Bruce, it's okay for us to put your presentation onto the working group uh, NASA Google Drive. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, we'll do that. So we'll make that available to everyone. Uh, right. Now, with that, I'd like to uh, switch our topic uh, uh, to Dr. Uh, Iman uh, Chakraborty. Sorry for my pronunciation. And uh, I'll let uh, I'll, I'll let you speak to the interesting topic. Uh, take it away. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Johnny, and thank you for uh, inviting me to do the talk today. Uh, I hope you can hear me, and I hope you can see a full screen slide. Yeah, looks good. Uh, and I'm going to make these slides available to you, Johnny, after the talk. Uh, I do have to run. Uh, 
exactly on the hour to uh, teach class, but I'll make these available to you so you can disseminate uh, as you see fit. Uh, so the you. talk today uh, is intended to be slightly at a high level and the contents are based on a paper that, uh, that uh, I co-authored with Rob McDonald that most of you are probably familiar with uh, on how to incorporate uh, uh, a fundamental battery model into uh, aircraft sizing. So I'm uh, Dr. Iman Chakrabarty. Uh, I'm an assistant professor at Auburn's Aerospace mm -hmm. Department, and my mm -hmm. lab uh, is called the Vehicle Systems Dynamics and uh, Design Lab. So uh, here's a little bit uh, uh, about me. I'm pretty in involved with the AIAA. I'm also a member of the uh, Vertical Flight Society. Um, the lab, uh, VSDDL, uh, you know, like our name suggests, we're very vehicle uh, focused, conventional and unconventional. We look at vehicle systems, sizing and analysis. We look at dynamics, and by that I mean flight simulation, stability and control. And finally, we try to tie everything back into the, the design of the vehicle. So that's why we're the vehicle systems, dynamics and design lab. And our research so far has been funded by uh, by NASA, the uh, the Air Force through the Agility Prime Program and the FAA, uh, either directly or through collaborations with various industry partners that are uh, listed over here. So at VSDDL, what we're trying to do is uh, establish this uh, pipeline. We call it an R&D pipeline for next-gen concepts. And the first uh, step in that is uh, vehicle sizing, performance analysis, and optimization, which is uh, kind of the topic area of today's uh, talk. And we use a tool called Parametric Energy-Based uh, Aircraft Configuration Evaluator, or PIECE, that we'll see more of uh, in a few minutes. Step two is doing stability and control analysis and uh, flight control system design and optimization. And we use a, a NASA-funded tool that we developed in the lab called uh, MADCASP. And so all our control law and simulation work uses MADCASP. Um, we do flight simulation, both desktop simulation and also human and loop simulation through uh, custom flight simulators that we've uh, built in the lab. And uh, we've received FAA funding to uh, study simplified vehicle operations or SVO using those simulators. And um, fourth step, uh, subscale uh, development and flight testing, which uh, we are now actively uh, doing uh, with uh, one industry partner and also as part of our internal uh, IRAD efforts. Uh, we use 3D printed subscales using the same SVO flight control laws as, as the full scales. And then we go in and flight test them in the field. So uh, a little bit about the PEACE tool. This was uh, developed uh, in the lab. And the idea was to create a tool that would be capable of doing sizing and performance analysis for uh, wingborne vehicles, so aircraft, rotorborne, rotorcraft, and also uh, vehicles using buoyant lift, so lighter than air or airships, uh, or using a combination of, of the above. So that was one of the ground requirements. It needed to be able to do uh, to handle different kinds of propulsive energy sources, so conventional fuel burning, as well as uh, different kinds of electrified propulsion, so all electric, hybrid electric, turbo electric, and so on. Um, you know, uh, as a as a as a private pilot, uh, I you know I keep telling everyone if you can't trim, you can't fly. So another ground requirement was we have to be able to check the ability of the vehicle to trim each time we do any performance analysis within PEACE and each time we do mission analysis. So trim or trim considerations, rotational equilibria are a fundamental consideration in this, uh, uh, in this tool. Uh, we do explicit power sizing, looking at both nominal scenarios and off nominal scenarios where something on the vehicle has failed that ends up driving perhaps the, the required power of a propulsion system component. So we have a formal method of, of searching through a lot of scenarios, looking for the constraining cases. Uh, we time march our way through uh, mission profiles uh, and, and look at what kind of energy uh, requirements there are. And then finally, we, we converge on mass and energy to get energy balance across the mission. So here's a, an extended uh, uh, design structure matrix representation of the piece framework. And here you see it tied to a, a genetic algorithm optimizer, uh, which we used in fairly recent work uh, in order to optimize an, a, a lift plus cruise eVTOL. So what makes a piece so generalized is really the fact that uh, you know we don't when we look at the implementation of the equations of motion in uh, in in piece and the trajectory analysis, um, the vehicle is really this blob that's flying through the uh, air. There's uh, there's no um, there's no um, focus on either a wingborne airplane or a rotorcraft or anything. It's a blob flying through the sky, which can be acted upon by 
uh, aeropropulsive forces, possibly buoyancy. And it's kept at that general level and all the equations of motion and the analysis uh, is, is implemented accordingly. And then different types of flight vehicles uh, essentially become subsets of uh, special cases of that blob uh, flying through the sky. So we have a, a very general implementation of uh, an aeropropulsive performance model, which you see on the top left over here. And that takes into account uh, the, uh, the trajectory of the aircraft, uh, what the state of, uh, state of control effectors are, the propulsors. Um, we can incorporate different types of aeropropulsive models, depending on what we're studying. Uh, we can uh, employ uh, propulsion and power flow models uh, when, when we're studying architectures where lots of components connect to one another. And then finally, the outputs of this are the uh, air reactions and the rate at which mass is depleting and the rate at which energy is depleting. And this APPM is, is embedded within and solved using a flight mechanics model or an FMM. And that's what allows us to solve for trim. And we can... Um, we can have a, a specified trajectory and solve for how much power is required to achieve that trajectory. We can have a specified uh, propulsion system power setting and find out what trajectory, uh, so for instance, what climb rate or acceleration results from, uh, from such a power setting. And we, so we can solve the problem in a couple of different uh, ways. So uh, here's a, a snapshot of uh, some of the papers we've worked on where we analyzed different uh, VTOL uh, aircraft uh, using, uh, using PEACE. We've done a bunch of papers on a lift plus cruise configuration that you see on the left column over here um, and uh, looking at different, different aspects of the problem. In the center column, uh, we've done a few papers on a, on a tilt wing, which is called the TW0 to uh, Pangolin. Um, and then on the right column, you see a couple of other concepts, another ducted fan, lipless crews, uh, and another um, uh, tilt wing uh, that we published papers on where we're using PEACE to look at electrified propulsion, all electric, hybrid electric sizing studies. And at the bottom, you see the, the very first paper published that actually underlined, uh, that actually highlights the underlying methodology of, uh, of PEACE. And in that paper, we showed how we could simultaneously analyze a GA aircraft, an EV tall and a hybrid lift airship uh, within, this, within this framework. So now let me jump into uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the uh, battery-related work. This was a joint paper that uh, I did with uh, Rob McDonald. And uh, as many of you may be familiar with, Rob published a, a seven-part article series uh, on LinkedIn, which he since then uh, compiled into one document that's available here, where uh, he talked about um, uh, the differences between electric batteries and, and fossil fuels that, uh, that impact aircraft sizing. And he, uh, he um, suggested a, a very fundamental way of representing the battery performance uh, and several knockdown factors that would be relevant to aircraft sizing. But what he did not do deliberately was uh, use that document to do any particular concept study. And so the paper that I co-authored with him was intended to do what he didn't do in his uh, article series, which is actually look at how that battery model can be incorporated into a sizing study for, for a specific uh, aircraft configuration that you see over here. So it's, the, it's a liftless cruise configuration that has uh, eight lifters and, and one cruise prop. And, uh, and we have a relatively straightforward mission profile that this aircraft is, uh, is intended to fly. So short distance because it's, uh, it's all electric. Um, and we wanna look at uh, how battery related parameters, the variation of those parameters can affect the sizing of this, uh, of this aircraft. So a little bit about the propulsion system architecture of the aircraft. So we have a, a battery uh, on the left that's, uh, and there are N such batteries. So N packs, number of battery packs that are assumed to be identical. And they're pushing power into different electrical buses that are connected to uh, the lift motors and the cruise motor that are driving respectively the, the lift props and the, and the cruise prop on this vehicle. So if you, if you do, uh, if you write down power out equals efficiency times power in for each of these components and you collect all of those equations into a matrix form, uh, you end up getting the power flow matrix system that you see in the bottom right. And if you invert that system and you solve it, then you get for a particular flight condition how much power each of these motors and the battery pack uh, has to output. And that basically is used for our mission analysis and also for our power sizing, whereby we find out what power ratings do we need to size each of these components to? Um, 
very important for any aircraft, but more so for EV tolls, is uh, point performance constraints. So these are constraints which are evaluated at a snapshot in time and which will end up uh, sizing the uh, power of various components of the propulsion system. So as you see in the table on the right, we have a number of forward flight uh, and vertical flight scenarios um, where we're either cruising or climbing or hovering out of ground effect. And um, some of these are nominal scenarios where everything on the aircraft is working A-OK -okay, and, and others are off nominal scenarios where something's failed. So for instance, one or more lift props has, have been rendered in up and that could be because the prop itself failed or a, or a battery pack failed. So something that's gonna stress the system uh, and might end up driving the sizing of some of these components. So each of these, the vehicle will be trimmed at, and each of these, the power flow system will be solved to look at how much power does each surviving component have to output. Uh, and we look through all of those and we identify the, the constraining flight condition that sizes different components. A little bit about the underlying uh, air propulsive model. So uh, we, uh, we use strip theory for all the lifting surfaces. So all the lifting surfaces are are broken down into a number of strips, as you see over here. Uh, we use a blade element momentum theory approach for the uh, for the propulsors. Uh, so each one of them is discretized uh, into little blade elements and the loads are all summed up. Um, and we use lookup tables for uh, anything that doesn't fall uh, under the category of a lifting surface or a, or a propulsor. So fuselage, landing gear, booms. Uh, and within piece, we have uh, geometry update rules, which will govern, okay, if the vehicle scales up or down, how, do, how does the mounting position of the boom on the wing change? So basically, how does the, the geometry as a whole scale um, as, as, as the sizing iterations uh, go on? And there's a lot more detail in the, in the paper about that, which I'm happy to uh, provide. So now a little bit about the, uh, the battery model. So um, uh, this is a very... Uh, fundamental equivalent circuit uh, model of the of the battery, so a cell. And the battery is basically uh, uh, assumed to be a, a conglomeration of a lot of cells. Um, so if you look at Kirchhoff's uh, law and you apply it uh, here, you can get a fundamental relationship for the terminal voltage as a function of the open circuit voltage. So the open circuit voltage is the voltage you'd pick up if the battery wasn't delivering any power. So if you drew a very small amount of current and you measured the voltage, you would get the open circuit voltage. So the voltage has uh, obviously a min and max uh, limit. Um, and the, the current, of course, is the rate of change of charge depletion that has an upper bound. And so if you combine these relationships together, you can get a relationship for the rate of change of the depth of discharge or the DOD of the battery, which is down here in terms of the current it's pumping out and the rated charge capacity of the battery. Uh, and, and that's really at the heart of this entire battery analysis, the rate at which the DOD evolves uh, if, if a certain amount of current is being uh, pushed out. So obviously we want uh, to know what the characteristics of the cell are. And the two most important characteristics are shown in, the, in these charts over here, which is how does the open circuit voltage change with the depth of discharge? And how does the internal resistance change with depth of discharge? And the good news is if you had a cell of your choice, your favorite cell, and you had a relatively inexpensive battery tester, there are actually formal methods out there that tell you how you can systematically test that cell and obtain these charts and also obtain the values in, uh, in this table um, uh, to the bottom left. So it's possible to characterize a cell and then we want to see if we can work that information into a sizing uh, study. Uh, as the cell gets older, the capacity fades. This is actually called capacity fade, and, uh, and the internal resistance rises. So an old cell has higher internal resistance than a, than a new one. And in this work, we looked at uh, modeling that through a stage of life parameter called KSOL. And for a brand new cell, KSOL is zero. And for a cell that's at end of life, KSOL is one. And we assumed that uh, you know, the capacity fade and the resistance growth factors were basically related to uh, KSOL as it's shown uh, over, over here. So now obviously we wanna see how much power this cell can put out. Uh, let me just skip through these animations. Um, and the important thing to note is of course, there's an absolute limit to how much power a cell can put out, but there are also limits imposed by the voltage constraints and the current constraints. And so we have to look at each of these limits simultaneously to see which one of them is constraining the amount of power that the cell can pump out. And so in our battery model, we actually look at the absolute limit, the voltage uh, limit and the current limit 
all these limits on, on power and the minimum of these will actually set the, the power we can get out of, a, out of a cell. A very important thing to note is that uh, because the open circuit voltage drops with uh, depth of discharge and because the battery capacity fades with age and the internal resistance rises, if you look at the form of these equations, the most constraining case for battery sizing in terms of power will be a battery that is near the end of its depth of discharge, so almost depleted, and at its end of life. And this is going to have a huge impact whether we make this assumption or not, whether we take this into account or not. It's going to have a huge impact on the, the sizing of the aircraft. Um, another concept that we use is a concept called reversible energy. And without going into all the math, let me just say this. Reversible energy is the energy that you could get out of the battery if you basically, uh, if you discharged it infinitely slowly. So that means with no resistive losses because you're taking a trickle of current out of it and it would take you infinitely long to discharge. But that's a theoretical upper limit on how much energy you can get out of the battery. So any real world discharge of the battery will always yield less energy than that. And so the concept of reversible energy is a nice uh, standard uh, like um, hypothetical ideal um, to compare any other discharge to. So the closer we can get to the reversible energy, the more efficient our battery discharges. So all the math remaining at a high level, all the math we've incorporated relates things back to the concept of reversible uh, energy. We've talked a little bit about already about the piece sizing framework, but it's interesting to note that the, the power sizes that you see here uh, looks at the power sizing of the battery, make sure that there are enough cells on board to be able to output the power requirements of the vehicle. And the converter over here makes sure that there's enough cells on board to, to satisfy the energy requirements of the mission. So when we take both of these together, we, we ensure that the, that the uh, converged design satisfies both power and energy requirements. And we can also look at whether power requirements drove the sizing of the battery or the, or the energy requirements. So now to get into some results, again, remaining at a high level, we use the piece framework to basically get a baseline uh, design. This design, as you can see from the weight breakdown table here, it's about a 30% weight fraction of batteries, uh, about another 27% or so uh, structures, 25% is the propulsion system, so all your props and motors, uh, and about, uh, and about uh, four people's worth of uh, payload. So that's the weight composition of the, uh, of the aircraft. So now, when that aircraft flew its mission, here's what was happening to the battery. So on the top left, you see the power requirements, so obviously very high for vertical takeoff and uh, coming down as it transitions, uh, climbing out, and then basically constant during the cruise, uh, zero during an idle descent, and again ramping up again as the vehicle transitions back to vertical flight, comes down and lands vertically. So here you see the depth of discharge of the battery. We assume that we start with a battery that's already 10% depleted. And we, our end condition is we have to end with a battery that's no more than 80% depleted. So we can only discharge the battery from 10% to 80% in order to preserve life or longevity. Um, now the C rate is, is basically an indication of how much current the battery is putting out. So notice over here that even though the cruise segment power consumption is absolutely constant, the current that the battery is having to put out is actually higher at the end of cruise than at the beginning of cruise because the battery uh, open circuit voltage is falling off as, um, as the battery depletes. And so we've been able to uh, capture that uh, within our, within our uh, battery model. So now uh, let's talk about the concept of reversible energy again. So here, this, this, um, um, it, the area under each of these curves is a measure of energy content of the battery. So the, the curve at the top over which the pointer is going right now is it was a brand new battery the area under this dotted line would be the reversible energy content of that brand new battery. Now we've assumed that the battery is at end of life and there's capacity fade. So the reversible energy in our end of life battery is the area under this dotted blue curve. But then again, we didn't discharge the entire battery. We started at 10% and we finished at 80%. So we left energy over here that we avoided using for longevity on the left side and on the right side. So then that brings us down to the area under this solid blue curve, which is the reversible energy associated with the discharge that we actually did. But then because we were discharging at a finite rate, we were losing energy due to resistive losses and heat. So this area under the red curve, so this red area over here is the energy that was actually measured at the battery terminals. 
And this is the propulsive energy that was actually used for the mission. So now um, following Rob's uh, technique, we can define a bunch of knockdown factors, which are all calculated over here, which are the ratios of each of these areas that I that just talked about, area A divided by area B divided by area A, C divided by B and so on. And each of these represents an important knockdown factor. So you have to knock down the energy content of your battery in order to take into account the fact that the battery is old, you have to leave something at the top and something at the bottom for longevity, and you're gonna have finite losses. So you have to whack down the energy content of your battery when you're doing uh, sizing studies. And we can capture that in a pretty fundamental manner. Uh, so now let's look at what happens to the payload range. Okay, and ordinarily we're thinking we're, we're not we're not used to thinking of payload range as something that varies with the age of the vehicle or the battery, but here this is very much the case. So here's what happens when you size this EV tall, assuming the battery is basically about to come off the aircraft because it's old. This blue point is the design mission. So a certain payload uh, to be carried a certain range. Now, because we've assumed that the battery is at end of life while sizing, when the battery is new and has more capacity, you get a couple of extra miles, you get some extra mileage for free. And as the battery basically ages, here you can see that stage of life parameter, zero means new, one means end of life. As the battery ages, you're coming in, the range is basically getting curtailed, but even when the battery is at end of life, you're able to perform the design mission because you took that capacity fade into account when you size the battery. Let's say you didn't do that. What would happen then? Well, this is what would happen then. You'd be able to perform your design mission the day you took your EV toll, you took delivery of your EV toll from the showroom. You'd be able to perform the design mission. But then as the battery fades with age, you're losing mileage. And when it's at end of life, you can't cover the uh, distances uh, that you could previously. And depending on what, how your business model was set up, you might not be able to connect uh, points within, a, within an urban environment that, that, that are important for your business model. If you compare those two together, here you see those payload range charts, uh, one below the other, uh, range to the same scale. But here's the thing. If you uh, size it using an end of life battery, notice how much heavier the vehicle and its battery ends up being because you've accounted for the capacity fade. On the other hand, if you neglected to do so, you would get some pretty sporty, much more optimistic sizing results. So a smaller vehicle, a lighter vehicle, but one that would not be able to perform its design mission once the battery starts aging. So uh, this in a snapshot, if, if the entire uh, paper could be reduced to one, one slide, it would be this slide which is uh, the ramifications of what, you know, what would happen if you didn't take capacity fade uh, into, into account. Mm -hmm. uh, this chart over here, I'm about to wrap up, uh, basically shows uh, what would happen if you size the airframe and then you froze the design of the airframe. And then as battery technology improved, you started retrofitting newer batteries, better batteries into that same fixed airframe. So each of these batteries um, you have an increasing EMFG, uh, that stands for specific energy uh, specified by the manufacturer. So the manufacturer does a standard discharge, and then they provide a cell level manufacturer's rated specific energy. So the battery technology improving means that number becomes bigger. And then we knock it down, we take into account pack overhead, we take into account capacity fade and, and all the other knockdown factors. And now you can see how if that battery technology improves, we're gonna be able to get more mileage out of this same airframe, size to the same uh, gross weight. But in each case, as each of those batteries ages from brand new to end of life, the payload range chart is gonna start coming in on the, on the range axis. But as long as our design mission assumes end of life, we will always be able to fly the design mission. And then finally, uh, you, can, you can see how a battery could be sized either by power or by energy. So the dotted red line shows the threshold range uh, uh, for, for this particular study. To the, for ranges that are smaller than the dotted red line, the battery is being sized by power. So the, the, the VTOL power requirements are driving the, 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 uh, the, the uh, capacity of the battery. Um, and if you can satisfy those power requirements, you already have more than enough energy for your trip distance. And as evidenced by the fact that uh, at the end of the mission, the battery uh, you land with less than 80% depth of discharge. But if you go to ranges higher than that, um, the battery is sized by energy requirements. So you always finish at 80% depth of discharge. 
but then you have a pretty steep increase in vehicle mass and also battery mass, which is this dotted line here, uh, for every additional nautical mile of range. And that just has to do, the, the steepness of this slope just has to do with the specific energy of the, uh, of the batteries. Uh, okay, so uh, here's some other uh, papers. Each one of these is hyperlinked. So when I do send Johnny the uh, slides, uh, you know, you'll be able to click on any of these hyperlinks and get to the paper. Uh, if, uh, if you get stuck behind a paywall, uh, just let me know. My, uh, my email address is here. I will make sure that the, the paper is made available to you. All right, uh, that's it from uh, me. Uh, I can take probably one or two questions before I have to run off uh, to teach my aircraft design class. So thanks again, Johnny, for the opportunity. Hey, thank you. This is a great, great, great info. I think it will keep us uh, thinking about it for uh, weeks or if not months. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, any questions that uh, anybody has uh, to ask, Ima? I've got one. Please go ahead. Iman, how have you thought about extending this to go from power to state of available performance, um, primarily thinking of thermal limitations in sizing the power delivery system and therefore the aircraft. Yes, so the current limit that we talked about, uh, it's, uh, it's quite possible that that current limit is actually set by the ability of the downstream system to handle that much power. And that could be a thermal management or a, an impacity of a, a conductor's issue. So that can be taken into account through the current limit. Uh, the other thing is the ability of the reducing ability of the battery to provide power as it gets di discharged is accounted for. And so for each of those power sizing scenarios that you saw in that table, um, you know, failures will occur, uh, props will stop spinning. You have to be able to keep the aircraft aloft with a battery that is at the end of its depth of discharge. So it's already 80% discharged. It's already handicapped and can't put out as much power. And with that battery, you have to be able to satisfy the power requirements of that uh, very high power requirements of that post failure uh, um, VTOL flight condition. So if you can do that, then when the battery is at its top of charge or has more charge, you can definitely output that amount of power. Yeah. But putting that conservative conservatism into the design really drives up the the, the required mass of the of the battery and thereby the the vehicle. Yeah, that was very clear and very impressive analysis, by the way. Um, the one other thought, I, I don't know how, I don't know yet how significant this is, but with greater heat in the electric motors, you get a degaussing effect that results in less thrust per current. In, um, and that would be interesting to incorporate perhaps as well, if it turns out to be significant. Right. Awesome. Uh, okay. okay. Um, I do have to go, okay, so well, I will. Uh... I think we better let the professor go teach his class. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Hey, thank you very much, everybody. Uh, uh, you have Iman's um, uh, contact information, so please feel free to engage further. All right, thank you. Thank you so much. All right, well, um, now we may have a few minutes, depends on uh, whether Bruce is uh, still available to uh, answer a few questions. Yeah, I'm here. Right. I actually asked the Iman if he actually applied to our program or not, because um, it's a pretty good fit for <clears throat> our STTR subtopic. So, you know, that actually, when I put the program together, you know, the two you, you two speakers as a, you know, there may be a synergy right there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I definitely will remind him of that uh, for sure. Yeah, actually. Um, <clears throat> I mentioned it to one of our researchers um, as well, but um, yeah, it's very interesting. And yeah, I have to, I'm gonna have to look at that paper. Um, the batteries are not fuel. Um, I have to look that up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, we have to, sometimes we have to think a little bit differently about, uh, you know, switching from conventional uh, fossil fuel powered uh, aircraft mentality, you know, we all have to, make some adjustment on the thinking process. Oh, I do have a question, Bruce. Um, does the uh, how, for NASA, uh, is it typically just one SBIR phase one solicitation per year? 
Yeah, so that's that's kind of our main line. So we we do one. Um, I would like to do more, but we we just have that. Um, <clears throat> we have an alternative. It's called Ignite. Um, it's yearly as well. It's um, very commercialization focused. Um, although we do have NASA folks involved in that. Um, they just, I believe they just awarded the phase ones. We're actually developing our subtopics for the next call, but um, I haven't briefed on that. Um, I still, I, I think I still want to do a much bigger presentation, you know, of NASA stuff, but um, yeah, it's another one, but we generally, there's only one AMD subtopic. It has been electric propulsion. So um, certainly you can provide more information on that. They've had it twice, but um, we, it's an easier process in regards to proposals. Ours, I don't think it's too difficult, but you do a little bit smaller and we actually provide people who um, apply, we give them a little more, I'll say assistance, you know, in hmm. writing the proposals and stuff, but we do a more commercialization based, you know, versus NASA and Fusion, although we, we consider that as well. Okay, all right. and. On the SPR and STTR program, uh, do you allow uh, like an open topic proposal that may not be specific listed in uh, the, the subtitle that you have shown, for example? We don't. We, we, we've had some considerations of that. Um, I think it gets down to... Um, finding reviewers. So not knowing what you're getting, making sure you mm -hmm. um, have the right people to review it. And again, we, we are focused somewhat on mission and fusion. I, I think one of the comments and, you know, we're going to consider this next time is the ones we have sometimes, some of our subtopics are a little too specific. So it's <laughs> difficult to be, um, innovative so i think one of the things mm -hmm. we've been getting feedback from companies is make it more open okay. um i know i helped develop something um for a test range here at armstrong and i talked to the guys and i said do this and they gave me a design specification and i said no 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 it's like <laughs> tell you know we're trying to say this is the problem yeah. tell um, me what you try to accomplish and let us be yeah. innovative yeah okay yeah so that's one thing we are trying to do, but they've toyed with that. Um, but so far, I, I think there is concern now. Maybe we should do something open, but not completely open. So open, but focused. It, it, you know? Yeah, got to be some kind of balance there. I understand. Okay. All We're right. somewhat limited. I know DOD does. I know if works does that, um, they have a lot more money. You know? <laughs> so, <laughs> I know multiple solicitations. So we have to be pickier and stuff. So um, okay. yeah. That, that, yeah, but, um, we've considered it, but yeah, still, still haven't. But I think we, we are going to strive to get them a little more open, so we can, you know, um, so we're not proposing a solution, you know. Right, right. Okay, good deal. I tell you what, uh, um, thank you so very much, and uh, we'll make sure everybody has your contact information. I understand there's a blackout period, so they can't ask proposal specific questions, but process general questions, I guess they can contact you and you can direct them into the right place. Yeah, I certainly can do that. And, and again, um, the link does have folks as well. Um, actually, actually, it'd probably better not to include me. Um, so other ones, uh, I'm going to, okay. Okay. I, I'm actually going to be, I'm going to be in China for most of February. So, um, <laughs> so okay. I will not be available. So, um, but they can find it in your, in your information, uh, who to contact and so on. So it's yeah. all there. Okay. We'll make that available to the team member then. Sounds great. Hey, thank you so very much. All right. We'll see you Good soon. Presentation. Appreciate it. All right. Bye. Okay. Thank you. And thanks everyone. I'll see you guys next time.